it's it's now one past ten in Finland and one past nine in the Central European summertime. Should we officially start? Yes. All right. So welcome to the second episode of Tuesday's Tools and Techniques for High Performance Computing. I'm Enrico Glerian. I'm a staff scientist at Alto University, and here with me today, there are other colleagues from Alto. Richard, do you want to mention something about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Richard Darst. I've worked and my current team here with Enrico for about, what, seven or eight years now, I guess. Um, and I started off as a, well, uh, HPC system kind of person, but over time we've gone more and more towards user support. And now I'm part of the research software engineer team. Along and with us with... today, there's also Jarno, who is actually one of the research Hello. software engineers. And I was saying, Jarno, do you want to mention something about yourself? Mm, well, I'm one of the research software engineers. Um, what else <laughs> is that saying? <laughs> um, That's good. And I was saying, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm also one of the RSC teams. In the pre Excellent. So if you watch the previous episode, the structure of the day is pretty similar. We have two hours of kind of lecture-based streaming. And after that, in the afternoon, for those who want to try what is being shown during the morning, you, we can actually do it all together in a, in a Zoom session. So because of this, the morning will be recorded and the afternoon, of course, will not be recorded so that people can interact. Other practicalities for the days, you have all, if you register for this course, you have received this um, notes, shared notes document at this uh, notes.coderefinery.org. Um, in practice, this is like a, like a Google Docs, you can think it like that, where by clicking the pencil, you can edit it. And this is a good way to ask for questions. And that's gonna be us following your questions or comments and plus other people that are involved with Code Refinery. What else are the practicalities? There's the possibility to get some credits, one ECTS. And uh, for those who are planning to get the credit, you can join the Zoom session in the afternoon where we can discuss more for the exercises and these other practicalities. Um, anything else to mention, Richard? <clears throat> I can't... Uh, let's see. So what are the things that can go wrong? So if the whole stream dies, that means my computer has crashed, which is very rare, but possible. Just hang around and you will, will return shortly. Assuming that Helsinki still has internet connectivity. <laughs> um, did you say how important it is to ask questions? Yeah, this the notes document is, is very useful. From the last episode last week, it was maybe one of the most favorite things in the in the survey after the after the episode. Yeah. Because you can really ask any sort of question. The goal of this course is to make it useful for you. We are not able to cover everything, and in two hours, it's very difficult to go deep into any specific topic. So feel free to ask even more advanced question or even you know beginners questions because any question is a is a good question. Yeah, it's good already if you have tested this document now during this icebreaker. It's good to make sure that you're able to edit and so on. So feel free to test it and type. And I can already ask for whoever in our team is going to edit this, that we could now start with the first section. So you have also received the link to the materials. And if you didn't receive it, someone will paste it now to this notes document. The material has various sections and the goal of today is to kind of focus on the daily work with the cluster. So not the kind of theory of slurm jobs or whatever 
resources, CPUs, GPUs. This is literally what you do every day with the cluster. So I'm going to start with a quick motivation that the goal of this, this is the kind of lecture lesson that I wish I had 15 years ago when I started working with this thing, because yes, I got introduced to Slurm. I learned how to submit jobs. I learned the kind of peculiarities of the storage systems attached to the cluster, but nobody has ever told me how to daily, day-to-day -day work with the cluster. Is it better to work on my computer, to work on the remote? So the whole two hours for this morning are exactly this. How do you work in the cluster? Do you work on your machine? Do you work on the remote machine? Do you transfer the data from your local to the remote all the time? Or do you keep everything in the remote? There's so many ways, and in a way, there's not a right or wrong way to do this. This is also important here because there's many of you, some of you might be in the early days of working with clusters. Some of you might have been working with clusters for 20 years. It's important that you also share what is good for you in the notes document because we are truly learning from each other. We don't need to go through the text of this page. You can read it later if you want, but I want to spend a couple of minutes on this picture. So what I think that many users, what I see also when I'm, when I'm helping users that are starting to work with cluster is the difficulty in understanding kind of the geography of an HPC cluster, meaning literally where are the physical bits and why does it work like that? So in this simple schematic, we have on the left-hand side, basically the internet, this bubble, this cloud, and attached to the internet, that might be your laptop at home or your workstation in the office. And usually through the internet of your university, you might have some network drive. There's multiple of them, whatever your university or research institution uses for storing data. <clears throat> On the right hand side, there is the cluster. Of course, this is a very simplified picture of a cluster, but usually it works like this, that there is a login node. So it's like a server, a remote computer where you can enter the cluster. And then once you are in the login node, you can basically start working with the cluster. You might submit a job. So something that is non-interactive like we did on the first episode, or you might need to do some debugging on the actual cluster. So you could request an interactive node so that you move from the login node to some CPU node or maybe GPU node. And then what is important to see that this connection between the nodes and between the login nodes, these are very fast very fast connections so that the local storage attached to the cluster whether it's this scratch storage very large and very fast or the kind of home folder is very different from what you be what might be the home folder on your machine or other data storage cloud storage that your university is giving you so of course the speed of this type of connectivity within local cluster comes with some compromises, meaning that, for example, if you would truly need to run some GPU computation that is very fast, but the data is stored in the cloud storage of your university, you have a bottleneck, you have a data transfer bottleneck, and it's not going to work. On the other end, cluster comes with the so-called scratch disk, whatever the name might change in different cluster. And usually this scratch disk is really optimized for fast IO, meaning that you don't have GPUs idling, waiting for data to come, but you have to pay this kind of speed with the price of the fact that usually, if not always, scratch is never backed up. So it's fast, it's large, but it's not backed up. And so you understand with, the, with this type of physical limitations and technical limitation, one is to build a workflow on top of those so that you can make sure that maybe when something important is done, is over and it's in scratch, you need to transfer it back to your university storage or to your laptop, or maybe, you know, working interactively with GPU nodes might be very uh, expensive in a sense that your cluster policies might not allow you to stay idle on a GPU node for many hours. So then you need to figure out how to work locally and then 
deploy on the clusters. So all this will be covered in the next two hours. Um, just a brief mention that, um, as you can understand now, we are working in a remote system. So it's important, yes, to understand the geography, where you are right now with the terminal. Are you in your local machine? Are you in the login node? Are you in a dedicated node? But what is also important to remember that these are shared system. There's other people connected to the same system. And so it's important to follow the cluster etiquette. There is no, how can I say, 10 simple rules on how to, what to do or what, how to follow the cluster etiquette. But there's a very nice research software hour episode on, on this topic. So it's an interesting one. Adapt, of course, with the practices of your cluster. Maybe if there's one thing of the cluster etiquette that you must always remember is to not run computations in the login node. This will be most likely reminded and remember for the next of the of the day. But this is the most typical mistake that even most advanced users are doing. So, well, we can talk about the homework in the afternoon Zoom. So now, Richard, let's of course start with project arrangement because your local projects yeah. in your laptop are might be a bit different than the project in your in the share system. Yeah. I will try to switch to my screen. Yes, looking like it worked. So we will head to project arrangement. So yeah, I mean, if you ask me, a lot of the daily work starts with how you organize your projects. And there's definitely some good and bad ways of doing this. And probably a lot of ways that are good in some cases. Um, and this is something that people rarely talk about. It's like, okay, here's your space, go do things. You can treat it like your computer, which might be organized well or not organized well. But let's start with a story. So there's a file which I probably have. It's a make file and I really liked it because I completely automated one of my first projects I ever did when I started my PhD. And I would like to find that file again as a demo of make files. But guess what? I can't find it even though I'm pretty sure it's not deleted and I'm pretty sure it's backed up somewhere. But it was in a directory that probably got compressed and that was probably in another directory that then also got compressed and is lying, it's like sitting around somewhere. So this is a good metaphor, I think, for what can happen. So, if you're not careful when enough time passes, then you can lose track of what you've got. And if even you lose track of things, how will anyone else be able to keep track of things? Has anyone else here ever lost a file this way? Like, do any of you have things that are so, well, that you think you have, but you can't find anymore? I mean, there is a whole structure of backup of old computer that contains backup of the previous computer, which contains backup of previous computer. Mm -hmm. And like everything from um, high school further should be there somewhere. Yeah. I have no idea where. <laughs> For me, yeah. I noticed that sometimes when joining a new project, maybe other others might not be familiar with the fact that Scratch is not backed up and not familiar that we are sharing the same the same resources. So I had people deleting my my folder because they thought that it was just some temporary. They're like, oh, I didn't make this, so it must not be needed. And then, yeah. so I guess that's another thing. When you have multiple people there, you have to have the sharing mechanism and know who's responsible for what. Also, how do you know if you even can clean something up in the future? Well, that's something we can talk about later. Um, so here is something we can start with. So in the notes, 
please go there and write how your joint projects are organized if you have any. So while we're talking, please keep adding these and at the end we'll go through and discuss them. Um, there's a good question in the note, should we use English only local language allowed, only 8.3 format or long file names? Let's get to that at the end, but do keep adding these. So my first thought for keeping things arranged is divide up your work into what goes together. So for example, this is one project of mine, this is another project of mine, and so on. So one of my original problems was that I put all of my work into one folder, and then in there I had subfolders for different things I was doing, and probably even subfolders in there. So they got recursively compressed, like I compressed a inside one, then an outside one, and I lost track. So what I'd say is try to keep everything at one top level, decide what goes together, give it a name, and that name is unique. For example, I would call some of my projects like LGM for lattice glass model. And then I had directories called LGM. And wherever I saw that directory name, I knew it was supposed to represent this project. Um, and then once you have the projects, in directories, whatever's in one of the project directories is always managed the same way. So for example, you always either use Git for it or you transfer data with rsync or something like that. And we'll talk about that next. And then I'd recommend everything at least have a minimal readme for you that lets you know what's in there. If the readme is useful to other people, that's even better. But you know, a little note that says this is what this was and how I was using it. So here's an example that might be from one of my projects. I have something which I call project A. And then it has a bunch of data. So the data is too much. I don't want to store it and track it with the main project things. So I make a different directory called project A data. And then whenever I start writing things, different people will have access to that. So I make a separate directory again called project A paper one and so on. And then these aren't subdirectories of each other, but all at the same level. So I can easily find them. When you're sharing these, um, either they're Everyone has their own local clone with Git, for example, and that's often used for code or papers or things like that. Or there's one shared folder that everyone edits, which basically should only be used for things like data because people editing the same code is a uh, not a good idea. So how do you organize your top level projects? Do you have these deeply recursive structures or do you try to keep it all flat and so on? Anyone else here? Well, I mean, that's a very good question. And um, in the code refinery lesson that is linked to this uh, material, we try to basically recommend a usual project structure. I think that the advantage of sharing more or less the same project structure with the subfolders is that others who might join the project later, they might already be familiar with the folder structure or the usual scenario that if you win the lottery and move to a desert island, mm -hmm. other people know where, where to find the different bits. In general, of course, I, I really like what you mentioned about having multiple kind of project subfolders because it, it it, on, on one hand, one can think that, okay, this is extra work, but this is truly data management in practice because you can really have, a, let's say this project A, paper one, can be, you know, only a couple of users should have read and access there because those are the authors of the paper. And project A, paper two, there will be other people. So you, you don't need to truly share everything with everyone else, which is some a, a bit of an issue that we have noticed in our cluster with this gigantic project folders but in general i mean maybe talking with each other and <laughs> agreeing on this on these policies is the is the best what is your experience richard 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good point about the master project folders. Um, actually, it will get. Let's go on and maybe we can t talk about our own arrangement because there's more of this later on down. Okay, so directories within projects. So once you've got a project, then try to keep stuff organized within that. So this is probably pretty obvious. So for example, within my proj A, I might have the code, some original data, scratch data, which is not tracked and can be deleted, um, outputs or documentation, the paper, paper stuff, and so on. And of course, the, the arrangement above some of these papers and so on were separated out. But if it is together, you'd keep it unique like this. And this is probably pretty obvious. The, least, the last thing you want to do is have to come back in five years and someone says, please, can you share your code? And then you have to go looking for code everywhere. Or you come back in two years like, okay, we have to delete the original data because of privacy or something like that. And you can't find where the original data is because it's mixed with all the other things. So keep it organized at the start. Next is directories for teams. So oftentimes on a cluster, you'll get allocated one directory for your project, which everyone has to share. So same for our cluster. If you're in a group, you get a group directory. Like for example, it might be called networks. And for the complex networks group. And then um, how do you divide this up? So for example, here we see scratch project with some big number. And I think this is similar to the naming scheme on CSC clusters, for example, and maybe others. On our cluster, it's uh, text names, but that might be unique. So then inside of there, there's often directories for each user. So for example, user one, user two, user three, and user four. <coughs> and then inside of the user directories is the code for different things. Code for project A, code for project B, user two, code for project A. And then these are tracked and synchronized with Git. And if you need to, you can go directly looking at other people's code, but you don't modify it. You only use version control or something to um, track. But then what about data sets and so on? So then that would be in a different shared folder. For example, proj a common data which is managed manually or however. And then the code refers to the data in this location by either the full path or saying dot dot slash dot dot for two parent directories. Yeah, okay. And I think this is probably what most of us in instructors do because we're all from the same place. Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. So how about this code arrangement? Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot about this part. So the installable software packages. So, hmm. wait, what's this going to be? So if you have code directories like this, it works and they can import each other. But once you start getting a bunch of code that's relatively stable and multiple people use, you can split this off into another separate package, separate from your analysis and so on. And then um, you would package that as say a Python package or C package or whatever. And then that's tracked separately. And we have an example of making a Python package here. And if you do this, you can even install an editable version, which means that whenever you modify it, the changes are directly visible. Um, I have a feeling something's missing here. Is this well, basically? I don't know if something's missing, but maybe a question that I have that would it be like 
let's say that we work in a, in the same research group and we maybe have agreed on a, on a share conda environment that, so that we can all stick to the same versions at least for a few papers yeah. would it be the best to have a share place where we all store this share conda environment or maybe even turning this conda environment to a module if if it's possible yeah. what would it be what would be your recommendation i think shared conda environments are a really good idea and could be done on the other hand once i was working on a project and i had started writing a shared library for this so library that would read the data and do some basic pre-processing and then everyone else would be using this library but somehow the arrangement got so that people needed to make some changes to this library for their own things so people would go and do the changes themselves to it and then um it would break things for other people and i forget maybe it was in a shared environment on there so someone would modify the code and then suddenly other people's code stopped working yeah so this is not necessarily a problem with having the shared environment but versioning the code better and making sure that backwards compatibility is maintained unless it's decided to be broken but yeah this is sort of an intrinsic problem when the code is going to be changing then you need an environment for everyone's own thing and yeah so at the end of the day it's good to talk with your colleagues and agree on whatever is your preferred policy so we are perfect with our timings oh, wow. and i okay. think we, we could basically move to the next section, which is are, about are there any data good questions setting. in the thing? Yeah, there were some interesting questions on the folder structures and um, yeah, yeah. So there's a good comment. Maybe the here. last one. Yeah, do you want to comment exactly on that? Uh, the last one. Well, I'm commenting on the one about recursive structures. So yeah, I mean, recursive structure is nice and that's what I originally did. But at some point, once I got too many projects and the recursive structure got <clears> too <throat> big, it became too hard to find things. So I said flat structure with the main metadata being the name. So for example, now I know on any computer I can list my Git directory and then it will have a list of all projects. Uh, but for another way, I know on any computer I can list my Git directory or list my research directory, and that will contain every name that I might possibly need to know, and stuff won't be hidden too deeply. So that works for my project direct mm -hmm. or my arrangement, but maybe not others. Maybe it can be kept clean or recursive. So. um for searching metadata well i try to make sure the name includes everything that i might want to search for with this kind of naming scheme that i showed and yeah for the last question probably the paper directories wouldn't be on this cluster but by having it as the separate thing then it doesn't have to be there for example um yeah but yeah, it's more of a example that way. Okay. Excellent. So now it's exactly 30 past, so we could see what would be the yeah. next adventure. So and I think we're going to talk about moving data go around. Data sync. Yes. So should I take over the screen share? Yeah, no. maybe. Please do. How about I start the introduction and then we'll give you the screen share. Yeah. So, okay. um... so yeah, data sync. So can someone add this to the <clears throat> notes? So we often learn about things like version control for sharing code, which works well and definitely should be used. But what happens once you get gigabytes of data 
or more that needs to be shared around between multiple clusters or your own computer and the cluster and so on. How do you transfer this? So obviously there's the answer of SSH, SCP, rsync, and so on, but are there any better ways? And that's what we're gonna talk about now in addition to the basic ways. So first off is make a data plan. So who has ever had a case where you're working on a paper and you email the manuscript to everyone and then you get all the emails back with all the changes and now suddenly you have five different copies? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yeah. So of course, that's why people these days use things like Overleaf and so on. But that's a that's part of the data plan. But for data, you can't do the same thing. So um, first step, think about what you've got. And the different common operations you might have are having original data and making a copy for analysis, archiving data when you're done, moving the data from place to place during the project, and moving the data, but it might be modified on both sides. And when data might be modified on both sides, that's when you start getting really confusing things happening. And you have to be really careful. So let's get started. So here's an example of a data plan that I might use for a project. So just to summarize, let's say I'm doing some sort of analysis. I've collected data from some instrument like a mic microscope or something, and the data is on my computer. And let's say I need so much computing power that I might have might be using multiple clusters. My plan is that the original data can get synced to clusters. So that's this input data. And input data is only modified on my laptop. So anytime in the future, I would only, like if I need to change the data, first I update it to laptop, then transfer it out everywhere. So that's one way. The cluster can do computing, for example, making these computed directories. And from any cluster, those are only transferred back to my laptop. So there's never a question. So the cluster always has the latest data. And then for example, analyzed is always then regenerated on my laptop, for example. Okay, and that can keep things organized. So how do we actually transfer? So Yarno, are you ready to screen share? Yes. Um... Okay. So first off is transferring data. Um, and I'll leave it on my screen until I'm ready for the next part. So yeah. transferring data is relatively easy. So you've probably heard of tools like SCP or SFTP and probably also rsync. So all of these use SSH as the transport protocol. In fact, well, you'll see here in HPC, almost everything uses SSH. And for that, if you set up an SSH config file, which we might see later today, but I won't go through now, it will make things much easier because you can define all the options once and just give a name. If you have data that's very, very massive, like multi terabytes you're transferring around Europe, then there's some other protocols people might use, but if you need those, you'll just learn them. And the main thing I've been emphasizing here, if you have two copies of the same data, be really careful they don't get out of sync, which is why I emphasize so much where can data be edited and so on. So our sync. Uh, Yarno, would you like to show? I will switch to your screen. Yeah. Okay. And okay. you can make it a little bit wider now. Yes, I can. 
preview. Okay. Um, so just before you walk me through the example, I'll just show you what I have uh, because I have a data folder in uh, one of the example folders. I um, I guess I should have then um, followed your example and created a code folder separately. Uh, but now we have a data folder in okay. here um, in the web data sets example that we used last week. So the data folder contains six files and we need to get these to the cluster. Okay. So what should I do? Um, so do you have SSH set up to the cluster? Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, I have a tab open where I already have SSH to the cluster because oh, that see. makes it helper to have the um, echoing the commands down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So right now we're on your computer. Yes. So I guess we start with rsync, the mm -hmm. command. Yeah. So and then the syntax is sort of like copy mm. where it's source to destination. Yeah. So I guess we move the entire folder. Or... Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, did you say first the destination? First, first the source. Right. So it goes source to destination. So data. So we do data slash everything. Or that's what I would do. Yeah. Or we can do um, recursive. If we do data slash everything, we need to create the folder first. Yeah. So I would recommend, as from what I generally do, I always use the whole directory names and then a yeah. slash on the end. And then for like the this. destination, also the whole directory name with a slash on the end. Yeah. So sort of like CP, whenever you copy a file with CP, it might put it inside of the destination folder, or it might give it that exact file name as the destination. Yeah, this is something that's always a little bit confusing to me. Um, so yeah, I basically always try twice. Yeah. <laughs> fail on the first time. So my recommendation is always okay. use slashes on the end and always yeah. give the final name you want. Um, so if we do triton.alder.fi, okay, yeah. um, colon. colon, scratch, scratch, work, um, maybe writing this out is not um, the most interesting thing, but already, we are already almost there. Yeah. Um, now this is the same IO example slash web data set. Okay. Uh, but there is no data folder there. So we do need either so, to do it recursively or... So if you give, it'll automatically make one name on the end. So if... Oh, this should work? If web data okay. set exists right. and you do, and you add a data slash on the end. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. So it will make a data directory. Uh -huh. So it wasn't recursive. So uh, RSync yeah. has So maybe this of... is a difference between our versions or our normal usage, but mm. yeah. well, I will make it recursive yeah. um, minus yeah. R. And it's taking some time. Yeah, so now it's not um, I didn't set it to interactive, so it's not printing out what it's copying. Um, it, it does take a well a moment um, to copy this data, and a want... big part of this actually is just the latency of accessing the cluster, getting a connection to the cluster. Uh, okay. Do you want to control C and give the dash I option? Let's do that. We'll see what's going on. Um, yeah, so it already copied the first two files and it's copying the yeah. uh, third one. So one cool thing about rsync is it will resume transfers that have already started. It will, yeah. um, 
if you cancel a transfer in the middle, it doesn't lose the partially transferred file. Yeah. It can't so preserve can control C to cancel it. And... Uh, yeah, so all the existing ones were already there. So you can preserve timestamps. So that way it will see, okay, is the timestamp the same? Then it knows it doesn't need to check it again. It will do checksums on the files. So basically make sure that everything is, uh, like it will read through the file, compute a checksum of it to make sure that bit by bit, it is exactly identical on the source and the receiver. And if you've changed just a small part of a file, it will only modify those same ones. Should we demonstrate that? Or I guess so, it's hard to um, do that. Does it go file by file? Yes. What yeah. do you mean? I think by default, it goes, goes file by file. You can also do partial transfers, and then it splits the file up. Um, what do you mean by partial transfer? So. Um, it will split the file into pieces, transfer those pieces one by one, and then reconstitute the file on the other end. So that if, um, if for some reason the upload um, gets canceled, it doesn't have to restart from, it doesn't have to do the entire file again. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's, um, that's mainly for the first time you transfer or, or um, yeah, I mean, if, if you have reason to expect that it might get canceled, if it's a really big file, then that's useful. But OK, so actually, um, without breaking the archive, the tar archive, you can um, modify by just adding stuff to the end. Mm -hmm. So I'll do, I'll do this. Um, so this will be modifying the last file in the archive, actually. Uh, because I don't know how to write headers for new files, mm -hmm. but that's not a problem. That's fine. And let's okay, so let's just do new file content and then the same command again. Yes. Okay. So. That was really quick. Even at the, the last file, I think it did actually a partial. Yeah. It did an it update instead that. of copying. Okay. So That's it cool. checks, it sees what's there and would only transfer the new stuff. So yeah, basically rsync is the thing to use. It's got options for only transferring files which are newer on the source side than the receiver side. Very powerful include and exclude kind of um, options, preserving timestamps, mm -hmm archiving everything, including timestamps, permissions, that kind of things, dry run so it would print what would happen before you actually do it, and so on. Anyway, yeah. we can play with that some more later. Should we go to <laughs> the two-way syncing? Yeah, so so this was only one way, and that's the main downside with our sync. Yeah, OK. Um, so if I delete the file, I delete a file or modify a file on the other side, um, yeah. It doesn't get overwritten, I guess, unless there's a change in on my laptop. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so let's do the two-way example. Yeah. So whoever has done two-way syncing of data for clusters and stuff like that? I mean, I, I did set it up once on my laptop, uh, on, um, on my laptop and cluster. But um, I think I just after I changed uh, laptops, I just never did it again. Yeah. Um, it was, though, it was really useful as long as the network connection worked. Yeah. OK. So the thing with syncing data two ways is that you have to remember what's updated. So imagine you sync things. Do you always take the file that has the newer timestamp? Well, what if it's been modified on both sides? Then you would. Mm lose the fact that there's they both been modified without warning um so any kind of good enough two-way syncing needs to record the state of what was last there and the program i've used for this before is called unison 
So there's different thing called unison. So make sure you get the right one. Um, actually, ah, uh, yeah, there is a link there. Yeah. So I did okay. prepare uh, by installing unison, but um, is there? Do you want to make some points about installing it before uh, yeah. we continue? Or... So Unison is something that's not usually installed on clusters. It is in um, typical Linux package repositories. So it used to be Unison needed to have the exact same version on both sides, which was a bit of a problem. But since the latest ones, that's not necessary anymore. Um, mm. But we can look at installation in the exercise okay. sessions. That's not interesting now. Yeah. Okay. So I just, um, the thing that I did notice is that my version at least still requires exactly the same version on both sides. So um, I have set it up correctly, but mm -hmm. so, that happens. Yeah. So what options do you use here? Um, that's a good question. I could check what I used when I was trying, but um, I, I think just the folder names. Do I need anything else? So the folder name for the source, and then yeah. it needs to be ssh colon slash slash. Oh, right. Sh slash slash, yeah. and then the address, and another slash slash, mm -hmm. and now the path Yes. on the other side. OK. OK. Does it already exist on the other side? It seems to have noticed some changes. So I, I think it already exists on the other side. Because is, is it the same place you've just rsynced it? Yes. OK. Um, OK, so. Um, Do you want to give it a new server directory side, to sync to? Yeah, on the server side, it is a new directory. It has been deleted. Uh -huh since the last time okay. I used Unison. OK, but I could give it um, uh, uh, a completely new directory. So let's call it data Unison, um, just as a demo. Yeah. So now it can start from scratch. Yes. OK, okay. so we get this yeah. blurb of text. And I guess it's just warning that it's a it's it's not finding the last state, so it's a yeah. a, a completely so, new. Folder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And here and now it's uploading. Things. It will prompt for every single um, uh, directory okay. the new things. What is new? An F means follow the recommendation. So it sees that locally you have something, on the cluster you have nothing. So if you push F, it will propagate it to the cluster. OK. And then push Y to accept. And there it's transferring. And okay. I guess it will so, take a while. Yeah. So now it's copying all of the files across. Yes. It, it asked only about the folder, but it's copying all the files. Yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, it will take a while. I guess we don't have to wait for it yeah. to finish because, um, okay. well, we can move on to the next thing. Yes. Um, and this will transfer all five files, I guess. Yeah, Okay. all six of them, yeah. In the exercise session, I guess we can demonstrate working on or how how you can modify things oh okay so yeah if um maybe let's wait for it i to mean finish it's to almost demonstrate done the syncing. yeah um so there is there's something more to demonstrate with unison then we can just wait because it's almost done yeah so once it's done can you delete okay. one file from the cluster and then modify one file locally okay so in the data folder we have these files I already modified in file number five. So let's do that. So I locally modified file number five. Here I'm on the cluster. And I have the data unison folder here. 
that's the correct one. Mm -hmm. So let's delete file number zero. Okay. Okay. And now I should be able to run it on either side, I guess, because yeah. it's a two-way thing, but let's do it here. So now I'm, sorry, I'm on the laptop side here. Okay, now you go back to laptop and it notices it's deleted. Okay, I'll uh, press F. And there's a change. Yeah, number five has changed. So accept and then Y. Oh, I need to press Y, okay. And there it goes. Yeah, well, it's all done. Yeah. So Unison is pretty cool. Yeah. But I, I guess that think... the, for the afternoon, if people want to try this, we will be there in yeah. the Zoom to help them. Maybe yeah. we still have um, nine minutes before the break. I was thinking that it would be nice to continue and stay on this data section mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. at least mention Git Annex that is there yeah. in the material. We will not have time to demo it. <laughs> but um, I really like uh, the mounting data from place to place which in practice is SSHFS. Yeah. So we still have eight minutes. Richard and Jarno, would you like to continue and wrap up this section and then later yes. we continue? Sounds good. Maybe I'll switch to my screen to talk about Git Annex. Okay. So Git Annex is a tool. So it it uses Git, obviously, but it, it allows you to track large files. So it doesn't check the large files into Git, but only remembers the metadata about things. And then it allows you to move these files separate from all the Git history. So um, maybe I won't show the whole demo because it's here. But basically, I have this repository called video processing. If I went in here and ran git annex list ttpt for HPC, it shows all these files. So notice there's a raw file here. And so that's a files. folder name um, in the video processing. Correct. The yes. yeah. yeah. And here we see git annex has tracked. These are all the large files. And they are all on here, which is my desktop. They are also all on uh, Triton, which is the cluster. And the output files are in Atlas, which is the web, um, the object storage. So this allows us to have a Git repository with all the videos and people to help with processing them. But the data itself is stored only on places designed for big data. Um, there's some advanced stuff you can do here, exercises if you want, but we didn't really intend to talk about this because it can take its whole other lesson. Okay. So I guess the, the really cool thing here is that you can I mean, version control everything like in Git and use Git commands here, but then just download one file at a time. So you don't yeah. need to have all of them. So it's very easy to get the data file that you need. Yeah. And the biggest comparison with Git LFS, Git LFS has one place you can store the files. So the metaphor I use is Git LFS is made by GitHub. So with Git LFS, you can only store the large files in one place, which is GitHub, while Git Annex is truly distributed. And it's a lot more complicated, but that's because there's this whole other layer of understanding where all the big files are <clears throat> and giving rules for storing some files in some places, but not other places and so on, which is really appropriate for the big scientific data concept. But my recommendation is if you want to use this, come talk to someone that's used it. If you're at Alto, well, that would be me and we'll help you get set up because it can be confusing otherwise. Okay, should we go on? Um, okay, I will okay. scroll on down. 
So mounting data from place to place, which is SSHFS. Okay. Okay. Um, should I do the demonstration? Yeah, I'll switch back to Yarno screen. Okay. So I'm really essentially staying on the um, laptop side here. Let's do BWD again. Um, maybe I mount, want to mount the entire web data set folder um, so that so, I can access the project. So can you clear your screen so we can be sure? Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm currently in my local copy of the web data set folder, but I want to navigate out of it. Okay. And create a new folder, which will be then, uh, this will be the web data set folder on the cluster. Okay, and it's obviously empty, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what do I do to get it to actually um, have the data from the Triton folder? Should I just go on my, um, or do you want to? Yeah, um, Something. so to do the mount, the command yeah. on Linux is SSHFS. Yeah, okay, and then let's do that. It's the source and the destination. So, okay, this, this is the other way around. Um, compared to the uh, previous two commands. Uh, but it's still the source and destination. So it's going from... Hmm. Um, oh, right, it is, it is. Yeah. Right, the source is now on Triton and the destination is yeah. the laptop. Yeah. That the meaning of source point. and destination are backwards. Okay. Um, it is clear, so um, sorry, let me get the um, the path to the folder. Okay, so uh, it's the cluster name and then colon path to the folder the full path. and then the local folder name. Mm -hmm. And the local folder now needs to be empty because it's a mount point. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here we go. And that was fast because no data is being transferred. Yeah, it did an SSH connection, but not much more than that. Yeah. So now we can list and uh, list the files in the web data set Triton, and it actually contains files. Yeah. So that's nice. So what you're seeing here is actually on the cluster. Every time you yeah, list. So we have the Unison folder here, even. Mm -hmm. So every time you list this directory, it's actually listing on the cluster and transferring the results back to you. Yeah. Anytime so, you open a file, then it's also opening on the cluster yeah. and transferring it back to you. Yeah, it, it is pretty fast. Oh, it yeah. really, it works almost like it's local. Okay, so yeah, this is also nice. All the data is now in one place, but I can edit them locally on my laptop. Yeah. And this is good when you need to open and quickly browse small files. Like say you're opening up images that plots that you're making, but it's not good for opening big data because if you opened a one gigabyte file, it would have to transfer that whole one gigabyte file before it opened on your side. And that would probably be a little yeah. bit slow. Anything bigger, well, it gets even slower. So, but I can run any program that I have on my laptop with the data in these files. Yeah. And okay. I can unmount it so that I don't, oops. Um, I can unmount it so that I don't break my file system um, when, if I disconnect from the internet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, and that's basically the summary here. Should we look at any, any good questions we've got? I'll switch to the notes. Well, there were good questions in the notes document. Most of them were already answered. Maybe we could have a break now, 10 minutes, and then eventually yeah. consider some of the questions that okay. we received. Sounds good. So keep, keep on questions. writing questions, exactly. <laughs> and we can be back in the stream at the 10 past yeah. the hour. Yeah, there's good stuff here. 
Okay, see you later. Bye. See you. Oh. Hey, welcome back. Um, so we are a little bit behind on schedule. Should we take a quick moment to look at the questions though? Or just get back yeah. to them at the end? I've been answering many through break through the break. Okay. Um I think we can go on. Okay, let's move on. Um so the next section here is code sync. And the main thing here um to talk about, um, so I will skip the demo, but um the main thing to, to talk about is why is code different or when is code different? And uh, the, the main point that you already mentioned in the motivation is that code changes quickly and has different versions. So you probably, if you have a, a code base that you've been using for a while um, that the whole group is using, then there's probably multiple branches. And if you have one shared repository on the cluster, then you can't just go and do git, uh, git branch my stuff because everybody else will see the same change. So you want to give multiple copies um, for each person and some, um, some global repository where all of the different versions exist at the same time. Um, you probably also have different environments, different prerequisites or different requirements for all of these versions. So that's why a, a lot of the time, just the, the things we did with the data, just are syncing it from one place to another place doesn't really work. Um, Unison works okay, but Git does the same job better. Um, if you use Unison, you can have a cluster branch and a laptop branch. You just have one uh, set of files reflected on both sides and it will get confused if you change the branch, like it will be like moving a lot of files back and forth. Um, so what I do to develop code on the cluster, SSH, um, I should mention works, SSH FS works quite well. So you can just use your local editor to edit the code on the cluster but I have often an unreliable internet connection or had in the past, so I have some bad experiences with it, mm -hmm. just kind of freezing the uh, disk or the file system. There's ways around that, um, but it's a bit of a pain. So what I do is not the best thing, is to just have one um, repository online. Um, in this case, we have the examples repository in GitHub, and you can have a one version on the cluster and or one Git repository on the cluster for yourself, one on your laptop for yourself, and one um, that's in this case on GitHub, that's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you, you make your changes on the laptop, you commit and push, and then you go to the cluster and you pull, and then you run whatever you need to run the cluster. Now, so is this what maybe you can come do? up with a better way of doing it. Um, but it works. It makes sure that it's always up to date on uh, in the main version, and um, it, it is a convenient way of transferring stuff between multiple different systems. So that's my workflow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you ever get to a place where you need to edit more frequently, and <clears throat> you don't want to have to? commit, push, pull, and rerun? Um, I do often make small changes on the cluster. Okay. That I then have to remember to co uh, commit and push. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, then just using some text editor that maybe, maybe SSHFS, um, maybe some of the graphical things that we will show later, but mostly just Vim. And I'm not very good at Vim. So, um, I mean, there are people who use Vim as the main editor, but I'm not very good at it. So um, I'd only do it for very small changes. So yeah, I mean, it is perfectly fine to do um, editing on the cluster. And I think kind of the main part of this section is about editing on the cluster um, and, and not doing it on the laptop. So, uh, but this is 
this is one good way and it is that like it has the big upside that you can have multiple different versions and you always keep the main version up to date like all of your branches are always getting pushed to the uh, to the main repository and pulled from there um, but should we move on to what I think is a better way? Um, so there is the demonstration there and exercises. Um, you can do those in the exercise session. Okay. Um, oh, not quite there yet. Um, not quite in the better way yet. But um, from this one, um, I want to do a demonstration of how to run um, small-ish um, graphical things on the cluster. Okay, um, so, so I would not necessarily use this for a big text editor unless, oh, I'm moving stuff around, sorry, um, unless uh, you have a good internet connection and um, all the people who run the cluster recommend doing it this way. But this is good for small, uh, like one window uh, looking at the pot and it, it can be very convenient when you're doing interactive development on the cluster. How often do so, you use it? I use, when I was doing research as not as a research software engineer, but also like as a researcher, I would use it very often to look at plots. Like, oh, I would essentially my SSH command was an alias to SSH minus Y or SSH minus X because I would just want to use GNU plot to run um, mm -hmm. to, to look at all of my plots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like what is currently happening yeah. on the cluster to look at just uh, um, the state of the current run by looking at the plot. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I did use this very often. So basically, throwing up an image viewer or plot <clears throat> viewer was yeah quite yeah, useful. basically okay yeah okay. So I will bring up the terminal again, and um, I just tested that if I run SSH minus X uh, Triton, um, it will not it will stop echoing the commands here which is uh, expected. Um, okay. So I will not run the command. I will switch to here where I've already run the command. Okay, so now you're on the cluster. <clears throat> yes. yes. So host name tells me that I'm on Triton. Okay. And I'm actually in my home folder now. Okay. Do I actually have, no, it's not in my home folder. So I need to go to the IO examples. And here we have this R example. Um, which mainly I want to go to because there's this GNU plot file plotting script here. Um, so, okay. actually, let's do a really simple demo first, just to check that it's actually able to open a window. So everybody should see a pair of eyes looking okay. at my mouse right now. Yeah. Over here. It's not echoing the command. So, okay. Oh, well. That's. That's too bad. It's okay. Um, now, I'll have to actually stop this to get back to my terminal. So the more useful thing to do is, of course, run the GNU plot script. So I'm looking at this data file um, that exists for this R example. Um, it, it needs a minus C. Unrecognized option minus C. What did I do wrong? Sorry. Mm, I do GNU not plot minus remember C. enough about GNU plot. Yeah. Could okay. GNU plot be different there somehow? GNU plot doesn't, it's not a module, it's just normal GNU plot. Okay, so I will not do to that much debugging here. I don't have blue plot here. Okay, so I, I must have run it on this side. Mm. So let's look at the file. Set x11 terminal, set auto title, that's fine. Okay, okay. plot input. So that's input. Delicate. The input file doesn't exist. Sorry, yes. Uh, okay. Okay. And I, in fact, did that on purpose because one of the demonstrations that we didn't do was modifying this file. 
So uh, yes, I need to change that so that the um, so that the examples work independent of each other. Okay, so now we can open quickly open a window, take a look at the data. It's um, showing some growing numbers. Everything seems fine. Good. Um, so the what this uh, minus x option is doing is it's actually running the whole thing on the cluster and then sending the contents of this window to my laptop, which displays it. So you can imagine if you have anything uh, more complicated that has more objects in the view, it's going to get um, yeah. It's going to get unmanageable quickly unless you have a really good internet connection. So, so it, it does work. Um, yeah. And if you're locally uh, close to your cluster, then it works really well. So um, compared to modern good internet connections, how good does it have to be to be smooth? I'm actually surprised that it's so good on my system now because yeah. I don't have a very good connect connection, but it's also a really simple thing. Yeah, so um, I, I would say just say experiment with it if it's something you want to do. Good. But um, whoops, <laughs> I logged out of the cluster, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. um, so what I what would probably have been better thing to do is to somehow copy this data file to my laptop and then run the script here. Right. So if you can um, instead do uh, run the thing locally with local data, that's of course faster. Um, yeah, but um, and I guess when there's things like remote desktops and so on, those use a different protocol, which yeah. is much faster. Yeah. So what you can do, you run the remote desktop at your organization, and then you SSH dash dash yes. X from there. So let's go back here. Oh, that's a good idea. Good point. Yeah. So if you have a local desktop thing that has a fast connection to your cluster, then you can um, use that remote desktop to run SSH minus X. Um, another thing that um, you can take a look at if you have it on your cluster is open on demand or they're similar. Like CSC has um, a similar interface. Um, and there are, there are predefined apps you can run. So for example, the R Studio app um, on Triton. Um, so you can run a graphical user interfaces uh, much more efficiently with a less good internet connection. So the, this uses the same um, the same protocol basically as um, a remote desktop would. Mm -hmm. So these days remote desktops are do work quite well. I remember when they were always laggy, but now um, usually I don't know this much of a difference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So should we move on? Yes. So, so the next section is called gra uh, not graphical interfaces, but working interactively. Yeah. Should who should share their screen here? Um, so if we continue so that I do the demos. Um, okay. Yeah. Is there something you want to say before we go into the demos? Yeah. Okay. So should I this... display? this thing that yeah. I'm displaying right now. Yes, let's show okay. this. So working yeah. interactively from the command line. So these are just a few tricks that are useful. Um, they're not really that advanced, but it's some really good stuff that can put people on the same page. So um, yeah, there's four things we'll talk about here. And the first one is interactive jobs. So if you're on the cluster and you have to, and let's say you're like me and you're doing some editing on the cluster, you edit your file, you submit the job, you wait maybe a few minutes, you see the output, you modify again, you submit again, you wait. This is really slow. It slows your development down quite a bit. So there actually is a better way to do things. And that's called interactive jobs, where instead of submitting your main, um, what's it, like your main program as a batch job, 
you request the resources you need at a, as a shell, and then you run the job yourself on the cluster. So what do you like to show? Yes, okay, so I will move this. And I don't know if again. other people, other clusters teach this. At our cluster, we actually teach interactive jobs first, partly to show just one thing at a time. Sorry, I'm in the background doing okay. uh, setup. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So we're on the screen. So Yarno can run s run dash dash pty. Okay, s run this and then bash and note that different clusters may have different ways of getting interactive jobs actually okay. on our cluster you can also do s interactive and there's a dedicated interactive partition but this is the simple way that can give you the <laughs> same resources as anywhere else so if yarno pushes enter hopefully there is okay. a little bit of time Ah, and now we've okay, got will... a shell. Yeah. And the uh, echoing the command is just not working. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So where are we now? So here we are on okay. host name. So we're actually on one of the compute nodes. And if we had requested, say, <clears throat> five processors and a bunch of memory, we'd have that same amount of resources here. So basically in a really short loop, we could go and run the job, see if it works or doesn't work, do an edit and run the job directly without any additional queuing. Which for me, when debugging things like crashes and so on that happen really quickly, this is really useful. How often do you use these? I mean, I just said that sometimes I use Vim to develop do most small changes on the cluster. Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm doing that, I'm actually in an interactive job. Uh, so you start the interactive oh. job and then you run yeah. Vim, the editor, inside of the job. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. Also, basically, whenever I need to develop something that runs on a GPU, because that's how we have access to GPUs, mostly, or at mm -hmm. least I have it's the easiest way for me to get access to GPU. Okay. Yeah. And it is usually for the cluster anyway. Yeah. Um, that's the end. Um, end result is that it should run on the cluster. Yeah. So what are some of the problems here and what can go wrong? Like when would you not want to use this? Or put Pain. another way, would we combine this with, no, actually that's later. When, when, would, we, when would we not want to use this? So, um, I guess the the biggest downside from the point of view of the cluster is that I'm now like taking a resource. It's only one CPU right now, so that's fine. But if I'm taking a whole GPU, and if it's one of the newer ones, um, it's mostly idling while I'm changing the code. So. Um, I guess like if you are taking a GPU anyway, whether it's on your laptop or on the cluster, then like, then you are taking one. Um, but if you are taking a new really expensive GPU and just keeping it reserved without running anything on it, that's a bit of a waste. Um, mm -hmm. The same goes for uh, having an interactive job with a thousand cores or something. Like if you take a really big part of um, of the cluster for an interactive thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just mostly running idle while you're editing some text file, so I'm yeah. editing the code, and that's not really good. So I guess don't take a huge amount of resources and do this, but take enough for testing. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's a balance. Like if you want to test in a realistic environment, and you can make some quick changes to fix some bugs, but if you're like starting to make actually rewrite some code. Um, then maybe like, don't do it in an interactive job or they have a smaller one at least. Um, the other thing is you, you do need to queue. So I don't use the cluster for big jobs. I use it for development. 
for the cluster. So um, I never queue for all that long, but if you're actually doing research and running big computational workflows, you, maybe you need to stick in the queue for quite a while mm -hmm. to get the interactive job, get the resources you need. Yeah. Especially okay. if you need a few GPUs. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Um, so there's a good question in the notes. If we get inter disconnected from the interactive session, can we get it back? And that's actually what we'll show next. So there's two programs called Screen and Tmux, maybe more, but this is exactly what it lets you do. So you can log into the cluster. Um, okay, so I'll, can um, we stop the interactive job? Yeah, maybe? I will log out from the interactive job. And now you're on the cluster itself. Can you yeah. do host name? Okay, so on the cluster. <clears throat> yeah. Can you start, do you prefer Screen or Tmux? Um, I usually use screen because I've used it before, but I, yeah. if I had, um, uh -huh. a good opportunity, I would like to learn Tmux. Yeah. So let's start. Well, let's do what you know. So let's start screen. Okay. And if we run this now, it looks like there's a new terminal. So this is running inside of screen. If we type host name, still... we're still there. And we're still okay. in my home folder. Yeah. Do you want okay. to run like so what's different? the date command? Date. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we see this. So what's different is since we're inside of screen, we can detach. So if Yarno does Control A and the D key, now yeah. oh, look it here. It says detached from this right. computer. Um. Now. Yarno can log out from the cluster. Okay. Now okay. I'm out. Now logged out. And can we log in again? Okay. Let's just do this. Okay. So here we are. And now everything's blue <laughs> <laughs> because of this. Um, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, that's okay. I think. Can we do screen dash ls? Dash ls. Yeah. Let's list what's going there. And we okay. see there's yeah. one detached screen session. So if we do screen dash X, or there's other things, I always do dash X. Okay. Then here we are, we've restored. Yeah. And this is really cool because um, you can <clears throat> leave stuff running, leave your editor open, leave several windows of stuff going and come back to it. But when do we not want to do this? Mm -hmm. I can't really so, think of much. Um, so would you it is for leaving stuff running uh, in case you get disconnected, for example. Would you so want... if there's something you don't want to leave running. Would you want to start some interactive jobs and leave them running for a long time this way? Well, that's the same, like um, you are then just taking resources. Fortunately, you probably can't get an interactive job for weeks at a time, but you, I don't know what's the limit. You can you can get it for quite a few hours. So yeah. It's probably not a good idea to leave it running. Yeah, um, like, because then if the login node crashes or something goes down, has to be rebooted, you lose your job. So that's the <clears throat> most important things from here. We should, or should we show, have you ever used the Python debugger from the command line interface? Yes, um, we do need some Python code for it. Yeah. Do you want to, oh, okay, so there is a specific example, I guess, that you uh, have in mind. Yeah, but. I'm thinking um, maybe we should go on to the next part. This can be okay. read. Let's. Yeah. yeah. So this is um, also left as an exercise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So next up, um, let's recheck the notes quickly while Hossein is getting ready. Yes.
Okay. Oh, okay. you mean the, yes. Yeah. So there's some good questions here. This comment of screen Tmux being absolutely one of the most important things learning with Linux, I would basically agree with that. So it is really useful. Um, and I usually run it on the login node itself because that means that if your connection to the login node gets lost, it stays open. And I can, for example, move from home, move to home and then resume it. Yeah. And so on. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, so one thing is um, that I, I want to either say for the first time or reiterate properly. Um, so when we, we skipped a bunch of things that you can do as exercises, but that's only if that is a workflow that you actually want to um, either just practice or maybe um, make yeah. part of your own workflow. Um, there's a lot of ways of doing the same thing here. Uh, so it really just depends on your preference. Um, yeah. We are trying to demonstrate or um, at least give you some hints about ways you can do things um, that, or that we do things that might help you. Um, so the idea is not to do all the exercises or do all of the demos yourself. The idea is to see what can make your workflow better. I guess we are ready for the next part. Yeah. So, um, Hossein, hi. So Hossein's yeah. here for the last part to tell us about VS Code. Um, can you... Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please do. So I will grab it from your notes. Sorry for that. Yeah. And uh, I should go with a portion of the screen as we discussed, right? Yes. Okay. So... Can you see it now? Uh, yes, and Wait. I will switch to this. So why are we learning about VS Code here? Why are we talking about it? Um, so when we are talking about like project de development, I would say there are like two approaches that you can do. The local versions that we discussed today that you usually keep your track of your project locally and do occasional bit pull and git push or transfer it with our sync and everything. And also you can do completely remote development as we're like discussing with the terminal. And uh, VS Code is like more of like a second approach, but it has a nice UI and it's also open source. So you don't have to worry about that. And um, yeah, it's like very easy and nice to use. Um, also, like the R sync and code sync and data sync that we discussed uh, is a very good way to go, but it adds a bit of overhead to your workflow, and VS Code can reduce that overhead, and so you can um, like focus on your project development. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Once we were thinking this was several years ago about how to improve user interfaces for the cluster, and we realized with VS Code, you can connect to the cluster by SSH, which handles some of the SSH complexity for you, puts it in one place. That can give you the terminal to submit jobs. It can give you the editor to edit jobs. It can let you transfer files up and down relatively easily. Yeah. And this was like amazing. Like we've been thinking, how do we have an easier interface for the cluster? And it was right here in front of us. Yeah. Also, like we are not like also in this session we are talking about VS Code, but I would say it's true about most of the IDEs. If you are using PyCharm or JetBrains, mm -hmm. the workflow is the same, and usually all of the features that we are discussing here uh, are nice. almost the same in other IDEs as well. So other IDEs can also do the remote SSH connection. At least with PyCharm and I guess JetBrains, I have tried, and yeah, yeah. it's okay. most of the same. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So, what can we demonstrate first? Uh, so, uh, so here, as you can see, I have my local VS Code. It's running on my local computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you want to get connected to a remote server, you have to have this extension, which is 
coming with the, with the VS Code, but if for some reason it's not, you have to go to the App Store and search for something like SSH Remote. Okay. And um, install the plugin, which okay. is the like open SSH extension for the VS Code. If you're using another IDE, it would be pretty much the same, but at least for PyCharm, I know it's coming with the uh, okay. with the IDE. Uh, yeah. Once you have it installed, you can see this uh, blue button on the left bottom side. Okay. Also, you have this remote explorer icon here, uh -huh. and both of them can be used to get connected to a remote host. Uh, if you click on here, it would remember all of the hosts that you have been connected to, and also the most recent folders that you have been connected in that specific host. So for example, on like Triton, our local HPC on at Alto, I have been connected to the, 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 the folder I created for this mm -hmm. course and like another folders for other projects that I had. Okay, that's actually new to me. I didn't know of that tab. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so that list things, and then you click somewhere. Yeah, you can go, to... but I, I, yeah, and, and for example, if I click here, it would connect to Triton and then go to that specific mm -hmm. folder. Mm -hmm. But maybe it would be better for demonstration to go from from the beginning. Right. Yes. So let's say Please. you don't have any any host previously, so you would click on this guy, mm -hmm. and you have two options to connect to a new uh, host, which would open it on a new window, or you can connect to a host with the current window, mm -hmm. and uh, it would list all of the host in your ssh config file which is located usually on your home folder and um so these can... these are the mm -hmm. same things in your ssh config file so it exactly. uses so it I... opens it and yeah so if i uh, go to my local file you can see that uh yeah so it's the, the same exact configuration okay from my ssh config file yeah yeah so you can add new configuration here as well by, by putting the address and also in the username. Unfortunately, you cannot add with SSH key. So if you want to do with SSH key and like put uh, the, ident the identity file in the config as well, you have to manually uh, change the config file. Yeah. But the good thing is if you click on the configuration of the SSH host and select the file, you can easily do it inside the VS Code. Yeah. So you don't need another editor. So the adding the SSH, adding mm -hmm. an SSH host, does that automatically add a new entry to the file? Yes, but uh, you cannot add it with SSH key. Okay. It just uh, the username and also the yeah. uh, okay. the address. Yeah, that's also new to me. Okay. Oh, so so let's get connected to Triton. And so, um, so this uh, is doing an SSH to Triton. And SSH Triton, exactly. config expands that to triton.alto.v, which exactly. is our cluster. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the moment, uh, in our cluster, it would uh, complain about a very old uh, OS that we have. Uh, it would be removed if you, you don't see this pop up if you have a like a newer OS on your cluster, but it's only a security uh, alert, so it doesn't affect any of the functionalities. Uh, okay. I can go ahead and click allow. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as you can see here on the left, the, the, the SSH button here, we are connected to Triton and I can go ahead and open a terminal. So so anything we do here, open mm -hmm. directories, whatever, it's actually opening on the cluster side. Exactly. So uh, the VS code is running on my computer, but uh, everything I put down on the terminal and everything I see on the, uh, on the window is actually running on the yeah. login node on the server. Yeah. So on the terminal, if I go with hostname, you can see I'm okay. on the login node already. So even opening the terminal is sending it to the other side automatically. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And if you open a directory, then? Uh, if we, yeah, I can go directory. ahead and open a directory. For example, the one that I created, as you can see, it's the already the file explorer for the for Triton. So I okay. Will go okay. This folder. is Triton. Yeah. Yeah. This is completely right now, as you can see. And I can go and click OK. And again, for the security, just about the Git and nothing. Yeah. So now I'm inside, uh, again, inside Triton, and I'm inside my, uh, the folder that I had for this specific course and session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is everything the same? Uh, what do you mean? 
like it's the same VS code, same interface. Is there anything different? Exactly. No. Yeah. But, oh. and, uh, yeah, uh, it's the same VS code is still lo running locally on my computer. And now with the remote Explorer, I have this folder. So the next time that I want get to get connected to this specific folder, I don't have to get connected to Triton first and then go to yeah. file. Explorer. Okay. Um, so this file Explorer is very nice because you can list all of the things you can create a new file here. For example, I can create something here, or I can create a folder. Another interesting thing is uh, you can do drag and drop from your local computer to, to here. For example, I can upload a file uh -huh. very easily. You will see Richard with the cat. Uh -huh. uh, is and, that from another course? Uh, from another session, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. so that's what today. you are missing some days here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the drag and drop from VS Code to your local machine doesn't work. So, but you you can go uh, and click right click and then click download. So it would download it to your local computer. Okay. Um, and it, the, the the nice thing is it also understands the folder hierarchy. So if you download the folder, it would create a folder on your local machine and then download all of the things inside it, uh, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what happens if the network connection stops or dies? Like, do you lose your work or is this persistent uh, anyhow? So for the co uh, so it would try to like get you reconnected and uh, try to keep like everything cached and saved. Uh, so if you're in the middle of editing code and you didn't save it, uh, it would remember the, la the, the latest changes. Uh, almost instantly. So I would say if you don't close the application completely, it would save all of the caches. And if you lost your connection, your changes are still there, but okay. you have to get a connection again. So it would be synced. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so if you reconnect, does it resume where you were or just yeah. have Okay. If you if you lose lose your connection, it would uh, try to uh, get connected the same exact window with same exact setup, okay. like the files oh. open and folder. Yeah. Is this even the case if you close your laptop and go home, for example, and then exactly. resume? Okay. But if you close the VS Code, you you would lose all of the changes that you had made, okay. like unless you have to save it on the cluster. I guess that's pretty similar to any other editor. Then. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Cool. Uh, so now let's say uh, you have like a like a project and you want to do running and like testing and debugging on the cluster. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so of course you can go ahead and try to run it here, but the problem is it would be running it on lo a local node and, and repo would send an email that you are running something on the login node because it's a shared uh, a shared resource. It's not uh, it's not recommended to do any computational heavy tasks on the login node. Also, this specific program, like estimating the pi, um, is uh, very, it's not computationally heavy, so you can, I guess, run it, but it's not recommended. So I would show you how you can um, run it on the cluster. For sure, you can go and okay. open a new terminal, as you can see, and try to, for example, run it with SRUN. For example, I need, um, 10 minutes of time and okay. like, mm -hmm. yeah, I need one gigabyte of memory and I would run the, the application. And it also has a mandatory argument here for, for, for estimation, for example, like let's say 10,000 iteration. Um, S1 time, oh yeah, it should be. It's helpful here. Yeah. So it's like a normal terminal. It would try to uh, dedicate the res get get the resources and run it and show me the results. Um, there was uh, I wasn't in the same folder, I guess. Oh, there was a mistake with. Oh yeah. It's because of yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the okay. uh, Yeah. So now the results are out there, but as you can see, like I have a, like I calculated the pi 
wrong. So there obviously there is a bug in my code. Mm -hmm. And let's say I want to do a debug. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, the best rule of practice, like the, the best rule of thumb, and uh, is to try to see what is the interactive sessions on your local HPC or what are the partitions that are dedicated for testing. Mm -hmm. Because you can do it on normal computational nodes as well, but you are wasting the resources. For example, if you are getting one hour of time for debugging, uh, like on a GPU node in our cluster, um, Triton, one single GPU would be dedicated to you. But sometimes in like GPU test uh, partitions or interactive um, partitions, these kind of um, resources are shared. So there is like there is more less wasteful resources. Um, so if I go, for example, with Slurp P, I can see that. Um, we have like a debug um, partition here. We have interactive session partition. We have GPU short and I guess GPU test as well that you can do the testing. It's like dedicated for these ones. Also, uh, usually there is a limitation for time for these in these kind of partitions. So your job would be almost instantly get in the queue and get executed. Uh, so, in VS, uh, VS Code has this, uh, like not VS Code, but Microsoft has this uh, open source application for debugging various to various uh, for various um, languages, including Python that we are using, uh, which is called Debug Pi. And Debug Pi is like a very integrated to VS Code. So you can, I guess, use other softwares as well, but uh -huh. I will demonstrate Debug Pi here. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is some advanced debugging thing. Actually, I've never seen it, so okay. I'm interested. I have to install debug pi, so let me uh, uh, log into, like, let me activate my, like, one of the virtual environment I created. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for example, let's say this one, I know the name, and I will try to install debug pi. I think it has been installed in that specific one, but let's see. Oh yeah, so it has been installed already and uh, I can run it to show you how it works. Debug Pi. Uh, yeah, maybe I can close the file explorer so it would be easier to see. So a Debug Pi has two options, like listen and connect. And uh, you can use it on terminal as well if you don't want to use VS Code, but here we would use uh, VS Code. It, uh, it also gets a host and a port, like a normal port, which has, which has a default one. And I will explain this option. And like there are like some options for logging and the PID number for that specific Python application. Uh, but uh, I will just demonstrate the show. So uh, the, the only difference that you have, when you want to debug your code, the only difference be, uh, when you are calling the program is you have to call it with debug pi. And debug pi would go to the resources and run the program and uh, open a port that you are specifying here and it starts okay. listening to that port. So another debug debug pi program can, gets connected to that port and it start debugging the application. Okay. Uh, so I can go ahead and say, I want to do a uh, run on, uh, for example, interactive uh, partition, I still, need 10 minutes of time. Um, example, one gigabyte of memory. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I will try to run it uh, with debug pi. Okay, so you use the dash M to say run this module and then that module runs the pi program. Exactly. Okay. And uh, the debug pi has this mandatory option for listen for listen or connect. And when you want to uh, open the debugger from the VS code, you should go with the connect option. And when you want to run the program, you should go with listen. So the debugger would listen to any upcoming debugger attaching. Uh, so I would go for uh, listen to any past coming on a specific port. I think the default one is five, six, seven, eight or five or something uh -huh. similar, but it's, okay. it's not mandatory, you can change it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then I can run the program. 
uh, with, for example, again, 10, okay. uh, 10 iterations. Yeah. However, the problem is when I run this, uh, I would get allocated resources and then debug pipe would get uh, to the program. It would start running and at the same time listening to the port, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is because 10,000 is like a very short iteration and I want to see where is the bug in my program. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another option called uh, wait for client. And the debug pie would not do anything running the code unless a debugger is attached. Uh, so I would uh, go with this option. Okay. Um, the partition line is yes. okay. Interactive oh. is not there. Oh, there was a interactive. There was a. Uh, oh, there's an extra T in there. Uh, extra T. It's there's RT oh, in back. Inter. It's me, yeah. I N T E R. Yeah. Intra. Yes. Uh, so now the resources has been allocated and the debug pie is opening the port, uh, but it's not running anything unless a debugger is get attached because okay. I I call it with wait for client. Yeah. So now I can go to the debug tab here and I can go ahead and create a, a uh, JSON file, which is how, how I want to debug my, my okay. like, like configuring it, the debugger. So you have to take this and tell it how to connect. Okay. Exactly. So I would uh, select debugger and it's uh, like, there are many options. And one of them is a uh, remote attach, which, mm -hmm. which means attaching a debugger to remote run. Yeah. Would uh, go ahead and says like where is it located as you can see. Okay. So I don't know in which computational node it's at, at the oh. moment located, so I have to figure that out first. So I can go ahead and open another terminal mm -hmm. and see, for example, what are my runs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see that uh, in like P eight, uh, the, okay. the the program is running. So I yeah. would. Go ahead and say it's like PE8. What is the port? 5678, as we just said it. And it would create a normal JSON file for me. Okay. Uh, but you can like do it manually as well. Uh, usually, it's, it's a good idea to change the name because you can have multiple debugger settings. Mm -hmm. I would say like PE8 uh, remote debugger. Okay. Yeah. Debug attach. And okay. uh, you don't need the pass mapping because, uh, yeah, you, you don't need it. But the the, the, the other conf you can see what the other configuration do. But you don't need the pass mapping for this for this specific test. Okay. Okay. So now I have it and I save the the JSON file and you can see that I have multiple debuggers and the first uh, one is the three okay. debug. I can go ahead and example run like I create a breakpoint here in the main function uh -huh. and I can go ahead and say like run. So you can see okay. this uh, toolbar is getting blue, which means I'm getting connected to that one. And the program is exactly paused here. Okay. So I can go ahead and normally go to the next function and create another breakout point. So, so the interesting thing is I'm using UI, my <laughs> local computer, and everything is running and executed on the remote server mm -hmm. on the computational node. It's like two levels of remote. There's from your computer exactly. to log in node and from log in node to the cluster node. Exactly. So you okay. can like watch all of the variables and everything. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so you when you dis when you disconnect this, the, the debugger pi would again like run it completely and try to um, give you the result. Uh, however, uh, you can again get connected to the that the, the, the debugger because still the debugger port is open, and until the program is finished, you can get connected uh, without an issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let me run it. I know where is the bug, and uh, the bug is uh, right here, so I can go ahead and fix it. And run it completely, and uh, I didn't save it. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, thanks for those who are able to join for the afternoon session in the Zoom. This is exactly the type of thing that you can try, especially if you have never tried it before. And um, so, 
yeah, we were checking the notes document and we have um, written there some feedback for the day. So if you want to specify if this was too slow or too fast or too basic or too advanced, please yeah. mark your... Anything else to mention, Richard? Yeah, I guess for help in doing all these things. So a lot of the exercises are basically doing the same things we've done here with a little bit of extra stuff come to the exercise session and we can work it out. So we resume not in one week, but two weeks from now, because there is a holiday in at least Finland in, well, a week and a day. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about containers then, is that correct? Yeah, on the 7th of May will be an episode dedicated to containers on clusters, specifically obtainer slash singularity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this was very useful, hopefully, for many yeah, of you. Right. Please write down one good thing that you really like today and also something to improve. I guess yeah. that's all for us. Thank you very yeah. much, everyone. And see you. Yes. See you Thanks. later. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.